Claire Nasir is a TV presenter, producer and meteorologist. Claire started her career with the Met Office before becoming a weather forecaster for GM TV. Claire has hosted a number of television shows from travel shows like Great Escapes to the BBC's Fierce Earth. Following the amazing success of her boot camp DVD, Claire is now writing a book on how to healthily lose weight. Today we join Claire to chat her journey to success, not sweating the small stuff, taking responsibility, finding happiness and so much more. Claire, it is so lovely to see you. Thank you, it's lovely being here. Um, so you've had huge success across a number of different areas of your life. Tell us which areas have provided you with the most fulfillment and satisfaction. I think it's when you, you get that job, you get that contract, and you visualized it for many weeks, months, even years before, and work so hard to get to that point. And they always say it's the journey rather than destination, and I think they're probably right, because there's a real sense of euphoria when someone went, says, yes, we like you and we want to work with you. Um, and then it's like you're stepping into the unknown, and I love the unknown. So being in an environment where you're learning new skills, meeting new people, and also putting what you know and what you've trained for to the test on, on a different level. So I've done lots of different jobs through the years um, with a theme running through them. The main theme has always been I have to love what I do, I have to have passion for what I do, and then I know I can put 110% into it. And so, yes, there is a real sense of achievement before you've even started a job when someone's just given you that nod. And how, tell us about your journey to becoming a presenter, to sort of, uh, you know, what, how did you get there? In a nutshell, it really started during my teenage years and I had real aspirations for having a better life, to be honest. And it's something which I'm sure many teenagers do. And I was from a, a broken home, but it was a loving home. And there was limited finances, limited money, and so I always wanted to be able to have nice holidays, have lovely clothes. I mean, I don't think I flew until I was 15 or 16, something like that. So there's, there's certain things I really wanted out of life. So I was determined to work really hard and get those things. But in the process, I worked out that it wasn't really about becoming, say, an accountant, although I'm sure there's lots of happy accountants out there. It's about doing something I knew I could work hard at and love every moment of that time because I wasn't going to compromise my happiness on that level. And that's something I've learned from my mother. Mm. So I studied hard um, and I chose subjects which I really knew well and I wanted to learn more about. So for me, it was mathematics and science and in particular, natural sciences. So that's the mathematics and the, the physics of the air and the ocean. So that's what I did. I did a maths degree, uh, but I focused on the mathematics of the atmosphere. And then... Uh, and with a goal in mind? With a goal in mind of working in atmospheric science of, in some respect. I've always wanted to communicate science. I realise I'm not a, a pure academic. And so in, I, I suppose at the back of my head, I always had a sense that being on TV would be great as long as I was talking about something I loved. Mm. Um, or lecturing or teaching or being something where you could really express passion about the subject that you live and breathe yeah. for. Mm -hmm. I did an oceanography masters and then I applied to the Met Office because the Met Office is an incredible training ground for anything you want to do in atmospheric science and I was one of 800 applicants um, but I went in there and I said to myself this is the last job interview I'm going to have for many years and um, I got the job. That's amazing. Mm, I know. And you, did, so, did you see yourself getting this job? Did you just know that, that this was going to be? I yours? knew it was my job. Um, and I think through years after that, I lost that ability to really see, think from the end. Um, but it's something that I was so driven, so determined, and I sort of cut out any negativity I was. I think also when you're young, you're in your teenage and in your, in your 20s, you are so driven and you don't have those sort of pitfalls that you experience through maybe the latter, later parts of your life. You're so idealistic, aren't you? Yes. Because you've never, you've never had a no, you've never seen failure, really. Absolutely, and it's something I think later on in your life you have to relearn. Um, something which is almost innate early on, but then becomes... Life knocks it yeah. out of you. You learn, you learn about limitation, and that's something which I've had to really 
you know, really learn a game. So I, I joined the Met Office um, as a scientific officer and trained just sort of a postgraduate type of course to become an advanced weather forecaster and then forecast for lots of different institutions and companies like um, aviation, farmers, uh, fisheries, uh, councils, um, energy companies. But along the way, found that I really loved writing for the newspapers, doing their weather spreads and also talking on the radio about weather. And then one day my boss in London said to me, you've got an opportunity to appear on TV as um, a weather presenter part-time at Anglia. And I went on taking it, on going there. Yeah. And that's where I really cut my teeth. And it was something which I have to say was the most scariest moments of my life is just being there in front of a camera and going, this is real now. You're on. Yeah, and, you, and I've learnt through many years of studying and learning and doing things, experience comes with actually doing it. So the first time you do something, the second, the third, the fourth, it's, it's so hard. For me it was, I don't think I was a natural presenter. And I really felt like every day I walked to that studio, I felt I was almost going to death row. It was that. It but was you kept that doing role. it. So kept why doing did you it. keep doing it if, if, if you didn't enjoy it? Because I knew it. eventually I would be good at it. Because I knew that hard work pays off. And again, in the back of my mind, I wanted to do it. I loved it. The buzz after doing a television presentation is amazing. But it's so short-lived because you are only as good as your last broadcast. The good thing about working in a region, particularly for me, and at the Anglia region, which is East Anglia, the audience was very sympathetic to my, to my uh, journey, I suppose, and encouraged me and appreciated that I was a youngster in, in a big field. And, you know, they were a good audience. Yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, I loved when you were talking about overcoming limitations, and that's really something you have to, you don't appreciate when you're young because you don't really face them. Um, and you don't interpret them in the same way. But when, when you get older and, you know, you've had more experiences and suddenly these limitations are put in your way, how do you now, a few years on, how do you now approach getting over limitations in life? Um, you, I've realised, particularly in the last few years, that nothing is that real or the fear is not that real. It's not real. It's only in your mind. Yeah. And by switching your thoughts to something more positive, you can actually turn any situation around, I suppose. And so reframing, essentially. Reframing is a really good way of putting it, Bex, it really is. And that's, and it's something I, I wish, and I know we'll probably talk about this a bit later, it's a real regret I had of, in my teenage years of not reframing, because I think when you don't, and you spend years worrying about, oh, you know, I don't want to live this life, I want to live a better life, it can it gnaws inside you, and then that's when you have health issues, and they tend to sort of manifest later on in life, and that's what happened to me. So I so I think that I wish that I'd learnt a lot more early on, or been you know had some sort of um, had someone to say it's okay, don't worry, don't sweat the small stuff because actually it makes it sort of lives out in your life. Yeah. So yeah, it the becomes fear. a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the, yeah, exactly. So the fear for me was something that is not real. It's not real. And and you manage to live that mantra in your everyday life now. Fear I, doesn't exist for you. I ha well, it still does on some levels. I mean, when my little girl runs out into the road, of course it does. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm talking more about my career and how what how I see myself more than anything, and how other people see me. And um, Does that I, change what you go for or do you find yourself bolder now and putting yourself forward for jobs that maybe before you never would have put yourself forward for? I think it, I feel um, a lot freer and I don't put myself under so much pressure um, and I think I did for many years and I'm much happier with the, 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 the really small things in life just getting up in the morning and and having maybe an hour to myself is a really lovely thing. And I spent years and years in a career where it literally, it was relentless. The Met Office were 12, 13 hour nights and days. And then after that, I progressed to GMTV as a presenter producer. And I, my life was really in their hands. I had probably one proper day off a week and I was traveling around the country. And you can only do that when perhaps you're not married, you're not committed to a family life. And you become so ingrained in the detail of your career and of the, the working life you have, you sort of forget about 
periphery and everything else is going around and it's really nice to sort of come out of that because I spent 11 years at GMTV and then I was made redundant along with half the staff there when it finished. So it was a real crash course in freeing up your mind of fear. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's really interesting because I think often people believe that they have to devote all of their attention to one area of their life in order to create success yeah. within it. And you, your identity as a, as a person becomes linked to that. Did you find a time when you were Claire Nasir, GMTV presenter, producer, that was who you were. And then suddenly you, you become made redundant. You have to reanalyze who you are and your place in the world. And, and it takes a long time. Yeah, how did you go about that process? It's, um, well, during my time at GMTV, I think six or seven years into it, I realized my skills base was becoming more and more limited as I was doing the job more efficiently and I'd done it year in, year out, and we were sort of re-looking at the same stories, and I was more or less doing the same lives every year. And so I really knew the job well, and I could probably dedicate more time to not thinking about it outside work, even though I was living and breathing it, and my, my extended family were GMTV staff, basically. And it is a real shock to the system when you're labelled, and you label yourself as somebody who's on network television, and doing a, a good job, you know, and, and loving it and being recognised for that and winning awards for that. And then one day they go, we don't want you anymore because you're not part of our new brand. And you think, oh, oh really? But I, but you know, and then all of a sudden you're out in the big bad world and the money is a different issue. It's more about your own identity and you have to really rethink what your identity is. The thing is your friends and family, you still are the same person. And as I was saying earlier about you're only as good as your last broadcast, well, those hits are really, it's almost like being addictive to some, addicted to something. You know, you, you get a hit of being on live television in front of millions of people, and then you have to go back to your own life, and it's been an extended version of that. So you have to re reanalyze. Yeah, suddenly you get this huge adrenaline rush from being on live TV, and then the next day you're, you're you know, picking up after your child. Absolutely. And then running her a hot bath, and you're thinking, what happened? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, it's someone like, you know, remember Dallas where Bobby woke up in the shower? <laughs> he was dead, but he was shot, but no, he's not anymore. And yeah. it does, yeah, it does feel a little bit like that. And actually, I see some of my friends who are still working in that breakfast television environment. And they're still on the treadmill. And I worked out, I didn't really want to be the fastest runner on that treadmill anymore. And it was really good to get off it and, and slow down. And bring balance into your life. And balance, I, I, I know, is, is hugely important for all people, but women in particular, especially when they become wives and parents. So suddenly this, this new freedom which you had found, did that help bring balance back into your life? Um, it, Initially it didn't because I would wake up in the morning and go, oh, I'm meant to be on air or what am I meant to do with my days? I mean, I am, during the time, the first few months of not working on air, I was working towards a fitness DVD and that actually took up probably more time than GMTV because it was something I was doing 24-7. I mean, I would wake up in the morning and know my whole day would be dedicated to that because we had a deadline for the, this, this DVD. And eating and to, right. And eating right, losing weight and yeah, all that. And also I had a, a child who was under the age of one. Um, but then there was another bombshell um, a few months after that, and that was my husband's job was relocating from the south in London to Manchester in the north of the UK. And um, that's a good three and a half hour, four hour journey in the car. Uh, my network of friends was down in London. I knew no one in the north. And it was like, well, I don't have a job to keep me down here. And obviously my husband's earning enough money for, us, for me to be able to do my projects, earn a little bit of cash, but also be a mum as well. So we moved and it was, it was quite bizarre of just literally arriving in this new house new home, new town, and having to start again. And when you'd reached almost the top of your game in certain ways, and knew people in the industry, and had an amazing network of contacts and fellow colleagues and friends, you're back in, you know, where I was maybe in my early 20s, but with, without the sense of the world is my oyster, with a sense of there are so many limitations, so I know what this in industry is about now. That reality, and how did, you, how did you pick yourself up 
from that situation it was, and move forward. It was a real humbling experience for me and something which was necessary for me to go through. Mm. And it must have been very, very interesting when you're going into these meetings with people who don't know you, who maybe, because they knew they were meeting you, have maybe looked at your portfolio and your show reels and stuff. How, did they ever come to you and, and you know, actually show you that, that you have additional skills than the, one that you, the ones that you've initially thought that you had? Not really, no. Really? I mean, I, I think uh, the other thing which I really have sensed in the last few years is my age. And I'm in my 40s now. And um, it was, you know, when, I, when you're in your 20s and um, my heritage is English Indian. So there's a very sort of mixture there. And I know it worked well on television, being a woman as well. Um, and then you get a little bit older, a little bit wiser, and there are amazing, talented people coming through the ranks who are fresh-faced, have the enthusiasm I did at that age, and really go for it. And not the limitation of family as well. I, call, I say that in the nicest sense of the word. So you go into these meetings and you go, right, this, this is what I can do, and this, this is my knowledge. Um, you know, give me a job. And here's my programme ideas as well. I mean, I was lucky enough when I arrived in Manchester and the BBC have just relocated there, many of their departments, including Children's BBC, CBBC. I um, had a meeting with the controller there, Damien Kavanagh at the time. And he liked what I was talking about and about bringing natural science to kids and commissioned two series off the back of our meeting through the through in-house development at the CBBC. And so I spent the next year and a half travelling around the world filming science for kids. Isn't that amazing though? Because that's, that's an opportunity which you never would have got. It, because that situation forced you to think outside the box. What can I do that other people can't do, that I'm passionate about, that I could bring to this situation? And, you know, all of the worlds collided. And suddenly you've got your own show, which is your idea, you're presenting. It's taking you all over the world. Had you not been made redundant, had you not been moved to Manchester, that would never have happened. Exactly, and that's when you realise you have to sort of face the fear, embrace the change, and really go for it, and open yourself up to these opportunities. And if it hadn't been for me just thinking, right, I know this is a big shot, a, a long shot, but I'm going to email this huge man who is just, it says yay or nay, um, and, it, you know, even though an, my, it was an initial programme idea of mine, CBBC took it and created an amazing brand, which was, I, was, I played a very small part in, and I'm absolutely honoured and humbled to be part of that. So, from my point of view, I, it's been a very steep learning curve. Presenting for children is very different from presenting live news. Um, with live news, you talk quite quickly and fill in two minutes. With presenting kids' programmes, you you're much more structured and you where four words matter, you don't use 12, yeah. basically. Yeah. So it was a steep learning curve for me and you know, and, and people had to guide me. I was there in the deep end again. But you were learning all the time. Yes. You're adding strings to your bow. And is it something that you want to continue doing, presenting for children? Oh, I love it. And in fact, since then, I've written five books on, um, children's books on weather not just whether on sort of sustainable development issues. They're for Key Stage 1 and the first one goes to print soon. So Congratulations, yeah. that sounds absolutely amazing. Yeah. So you're going to be doing this. What else are you going to be doing in the next 12 months? What are your plans? Um, well, I've, I'm also writing a weight loss book at the moment. Oh, yes. Interesting. And I know this is something close to both of our hearts and we've discussed it many a time. And it's, um, it's again, I'm on my third or fourth version now because I started with my DVD, um, which was now four years ago. It became a bestseller. Was that four years ago mm, now? That's it was, amazing. and I lost three and a half stone in weight. Incredible. And it was a baptism of fire, and um, it was probably the hardest project I've ever undertaken. So why was it so hard? I had to lose the weight in a fairly short period of time based around the DVD that we, we devised together with the trainer. And it was all uh, around the theory of high intensity interval training. Mm -hmm. So raising your heart rate really quickly and then having sort of active recovery in between. Um, but, and we didn't focus very much on food, it was all about exercise, but we both know that to lose weight, it's probably 60% diet or good eating, maybe more, you would say, I, I agree. 
and that then that 40, 30, 25% is exercise. So putting your body through training like a Trojan is a very hard thing to do and it's, a, it's probably the hardest way of losing weight. I think there needs to be a balance. So since then I've had to really re-evaluate where I stand on the issue of weight loss and how I feel about it because it was a very personal journey for me as well because a lot of the photographs of me being larger than I am now were in the press and quite ridiculing in a way. So yes, there's been a lot of sort of personal thought and then what, what is good for you is restrictive diet good for you, is eating um, in a really sort of regimented way good and actually I've, I've worked out, no, it's not. So yes, there's been many versions of this book and I'm still rewriting and I go to, I've got a li lovely literary agent who's done a lot of weight loss books and she red pens most of it and goes, go back, that's been done, that's been done, why are you repeating this? And then it has to be a clan, as it? it's got to be from my own personal experience. So that's a work in progress. Wow, that sounds fascinating and enjoyable in lots of ways because it's for you and your own health, but it's also sharing that wisdom with other women who have are and have struggled maybe in the same way that, that you did um, and sharing that knowledge because I think when I speak to women, there's a huge amount of confusion and frustration. Absolutely, you've got it, that's exactly what it is. And it's yeah. so difficult because there's so much information and, and you're probably finding this, you know, you probably try things on yourself to see whether they work. And I think most people can cope with, you know, something for a couple of weeks. But when it comes down to restriction, deprivation, starvation, we're not biologically, you know, created to cope with that. And it becomes a matter of willpower. And in the end, no one can live like that. So these, many of these diets are, they work, you know, because you're restricting your calories in some way, but they work for the short term. They're not, they're not a practical way to live your life. And I'm sure your book is going to actually, because you do it every day, you know, you have managed to maintain your phenomenal figure over the last four years, I assume without dedicating all day, every day to oh, no, I go to the I go to the gym for an hour twice a week. Yeah. Um, and I do a little bit of running outside because I like it, but that's more for clearing your mind. Mm, I don't yeah, think... Endorphin rush. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's not for weight loss. Don't think ever that running is going to lose weight unless you're training around it. Yeah. It's just good for your and head. And you're eating with the... You know, you're supporting your body. And I think one of the things that I, I talk about a lot is women don't eat enough to support the exercise that they're doing. They think, oh, I'll just, you know, I'll have a thousand calories a day and do loads of exercise, but they don't realize that, that <laughs> their body ends up eating itself. Yeah. It doesn't. And it shuts down, it, you know, and that's why people plateau so much on weight loss um, programs. Yeah. And I've, I've gone through every stage of that, I really have, and it's been a fascinating journey because the more you read, the more confused you can get yeah. and you try everything. And that's why the weight loss industry is such a multi-billion dollar industry. And some people are making a lot of money out of it. And my criteria, which I've always come back to, it has to be, well, no cost at all. It has to be brilliant for me and I have to be able to maintain it for the rest of my life. Mm. And so, you know. And has that approach changed? Now you have a daughter and she is watching what mummy eats. She's yes. watching what mummy does. Just suddenly it's not about losing as much weight as possible. It's like, how do I feed my body so that I have energy to play with my daughter? So I am, I am a good role model for it's her. It's all about energy. It's all about um, putting good stuff into your body. My daughter says, is that healthy, mum? And I don't mind that at all. Um, but when she will, and I'm sure she will, because we live in a society where we're body obsessed, you know, I look at my tummy or, you know, we're all beautiful in our own ways. And one key thing I've stopped doing, and honestly, Bex, this has been the, one of the hardest things of shifting is from looking at my body and criticizing bits to looking at my body and going, I love my body. Yeah. And this is not in an egotistical way. It's just, I'm tired of looking at other people's bodies, envying them and looking at mine going, oh, what about that Not good bit? enough. It's, and that just, if you keep thinking like that, it reinforces it and you, you keep on living like that. And that's the reason why the diet industry is still making loads of money. It's because of our own sense of who we are. Absolutely. And I want my daughter to grow up in an environment where she loves herself in a way which is healthy and it's good. And so she doesn't put rubbish into her mouth 
because she knows it's bad for you. Yeah, and so I, that leads really nicely into my next question, which would be about, you know, the three things that you would say for a, a healthy but practical lifestyle. Yeah. And I think you've probably just outlined them mm -hmm. um, because there are so many different things out there. But the reality is if, if you know yourself, you know your body, you're listening to your body and what works and you, you live by the mantra, I want to put good things into it. You can't go far wrong. You can't go wrong, no. I mean, my key one, and I do this with my daughter, is water, to stay hydrated. And that's a good foundation and basis for any weight loss program if you want to go down that route. When I say weight loss, if you want to shift a few pounds because you're feeling flabby. Water, hydration, it creates a really good platform for the start of your day. And you don't confuse hunger with thirst. You feel hydrated, you don't crave sugar as many people do, and that's dehydration. When your mouth is dry, that's the last sign your body is thirsty. There are many more signs which we don't recognize within our body. So that's the key one for me, water. Yeah. And it's so simple, it doesn't cost a lot. It doesn't cost yeah. a lot, and we're, we, we're so obsessed by having all of these different juices and, and you know, pre-exercise drinks, post-exercise drinks, but water. <laughs> <laughs> it's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer mm -hmm. for the skin, for the yeah. hair, for... It's amazing. I did this experiment recently where I thought, right, I'm going to drink through a day, three and a half litres a day. Now, that's a lot of water. Yeah. But actually, my body readjusted quite quickly. And the most incredible thing, after three weeks, I did get on the scales. I'd lost six pounds. I had not changed my diet whatsoever. And I eat fairly healthy, but I eat, I've got a big appetite. And my skin looked just it was just better it just I felt like I was just shining I was glowing um, and initially I think it's very hard to drink that sort of um, that amount of water that volume of water but it's something you have to build up to the other thing I added to my diet was um, Himalayan salt wow tell me about yeah, that it's um, a very good way for your cells to absorb more water salt um, in the in its unrefined state yes so not table salt. no not table salt not low salt which is just like poison yeah. it's like white sugar it's it's got more than 80 different properties in it like proper old rock salt sea salt himalayan salt i think is probably the so best do you add it to your food or do you take i add it i added it i had to add it to my food but when you're drinking that sort of levels of water you do need a lot you need more salt i think that's why may, some people they go to places like india and they get delhi belly because they're drinking so much water and they're diluting all the salts in their body and then they feel absolutely so ill salt is really key and when i go to india i always add salt to my drinks just a tiny little bit i mean i'm talking in a day less than a quarter of a teaspoonful a tiny, tiny. tiny bit but a little bit on your tongue drink when you drink your water and it really makes a difference. It's good, it's good for energy, it's good for um, sort of um, filing out those spikes in insulin that you get, the yeah. sugar cravings. Yeah. It's just, I think it's a magic property and um, yeah. Fascinating, I'm gonna be trying that. <laughs> now you did talk just very briefly then about sugar. Now I'm going through a sugar detox at the moment because I'm a big fan, um, but obviously I understand how incredibly bad it is for you. Do you live a life of no sugar, Oh, no, no, absolutely not. I do like a glass of wine, and that's like yeah. drinking sugar. Yeah. Um, but you do, I do sense, I know it the next day, um, because I, I'm craving food, which has probably um, got no good minerals in it, but a huge amount of calories. Mm, empty calories. Empty calories, yes. Um, so, and I, I do, I like a little bit of chocolate, but I've just switched to 85% um, chocolate, dark chocolate. Yeah. And it's really lovely. And you can buy the raw chocolate, which has the same effect on your body without the sugar at all. Mm. Um, so yes, sugar for me is a real no-no. Um, and But it's something I still do crave. It's, it's really part of the chemistry of all of our bodies, really, because it feels good when you eat a little bit of sugar. It does. You have too much and you can feel absolutely wretched. And it's, it's a key to, I think, having a vibrant, a, a key to vitality just cut out the sugar. And has this changed since your your DVD came out and you lost all of that weight? Has your attitude towards food and, and what you eat and what you, you know, when you eat certain things, has that all changed through the education? I think through education and reading and but listening as well, listening to people and what works for them. 
And I think one thing that you're in, particularly when we talk about nutrition, you're always going to be the student and never the, the teacher really, because there's always something else to learn. And I think with that attitude, reading with an open mind these things, I'm not talking about fatty diets here, and I'm not talking about pill popping at all. I'm talking about really good, wholesome, organic food. I think one key thing is, if your food that you're eating only has one ingredient in it, like that, like whether it's an avocado or an egg, then you can't go far wrong. It's when things are refined and when they are put they're made in a an laboratory. Yes, when they're processed. Yeah. You really have to start thinking twice because the amount of added sugar and salt in these foods is so bad for you. It's not even like you might pile on a couple of pounds. It's bad for your brain, it's bad for your blood, it's bad for your organs. And so from my point of view, my daughter and I cook together, we chop together, we eat, we love this. I don't want my daughter to be food phobic in any shape or form. And I don't think you can go far wrong then. That sounds amazing. <laughs> now through everything that you've said, you're an incredibly motivated woman. How do, you, how do you get so motivated? What drives you? I think one thing that drives me now, Bex, is not having a nine to five job. And now I did love my job uh, when I was a staff member, and I've been a, I was a staff member, whether it was the Met Office or ITV or the GMTV, for almost going on for 19 years. And I think in that time, I'd sort of slowed down a little bit and I became a little bit, I'm saying complacent in the nicest sense of the word. But when you're on your toes and you're in um, an industry where there's a huge amount of talent out there, you've got to really be motivated. And motivated in the way that you want to keep on doing the things that you love. And this is something which I've had a philosophy for, for, for since I started work. And I continue to want to do things which inspire me, mean that I can be creative and which may, uh, mean I can work with like-minded people. And to do that, you have to keep your finger on the pulse. In life. Yeah, absolutely. One thing I've realized over the last few years is that what I did when I was very young, when I was going into a career, was I spent a lot of time imagining myself, like thinking from the end. And yeah, you I mentioned that before, mm. and I wanted to come back to that. And, and is that sort of like visualizations? Is yes, that... I mean, I, the visualization thing is something which I think I've tried to apply for many years, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Mm. Um, and it is like that, really. It's a real sense of, in your own mind, imagining yourself. And I'm not, not saying looking at myself as a third person, feeling and touching and smelling whatever that you whatever you want so, so as if you're already yeah. there as if it's already yours yes so with um say having a child and um i went through many bouts of uh fertility treatment to have my daughter um i had to really think from the end there and imagine myself holding my child and looking into my child's eyes and you know holding her little finger and, that, and feeling it and loving it, and rather than having a sense every time the fertility treatment failed, like, it's never going to happen to me. Because that is just why, it's, 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 you know, it's a, you, you're going for disaster that way. Yeah. So, and I've tried to start doing that again. I think I did do that naturally when I was much younger. Whereas, and whereas when you become comfortable in a routine and in a job, you forget about those things because you're not thirsting for them. Yeah. So it's relearning those skills and stopping. I mean, we, are, we live a life of abundance and abundance is in here and it's only the limitation that we put on ourselves. That's the thing we have to sort of dissolve. And the social comparison. I think that is a disease that we have we are constantly comparing ourselves to people on TV, our best friend who seems to be happier than we are and thinner than we are and prettier than we are and has a better job than we do and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It is, it is that scarcity mindset of I don't have enough, I'm not enough. It's the negativity. I mean, you've just said it, I don't, I don't. And I do this with my daughter. I say, um, before she goes to sleep every night, I give her a beautiful scenario for the morning. So like, Sienna, when we wake up, we are going to do this and we're going to do that and we are going to have the most amazing meal with daddy. And all these things are slowly sinking in as she's going to sleep. And I think that's, I mean, my grandma always said, never go to bed on an argument with your husband. And I think that's a really good um, piece of advice. Do you live by that? Yeah, I do actually. Do I really don't you? like, I don't like any negative feeling in the house anyway. And resolving problems quickly is really important to me and also to my husband, Chris. Um, and I want my daughter to, wake up in the morning and want to jump out of bed rather than hide under the duvet. Yeah, have things to look forward to, that positivity. And, and that is certainly something which we know we can reprogram our brains for positivity. The more we think positive thoughts, the more we 
think we live thoughts. yeah we live and we live out we live out what we think yeah. we are first our thoughts secondly we are live in this real world this physical world yeah. and if you can they say change your thoughts change your change your life it's a very buddhist way of thinking and i think it's absolutely it's so true i mean you know they've been practicing it for thousands of years they know what they're talking about <laughs> And, and you've probably already touched on this, but if I said to you, what was the most impactful piece of advice, the greatest lesson that anyone has ever taught you? What is it and who taught it to you? Uh, right. Well, this is really something that I've read rather than, I mean, and I've, I've been surrounded by really wise people through the years. But for me, this has had a bigger impact than anything else. And it's something we have touched on before. And that is a lot of our thoughts are not real and they're not us mm. and they don't mean anything and we can clutter our minds with so much rubbish and believe it like my thighs are too big I'm never gonna get a good job and just one little tweak in your head and changing from negative to positive has the most incredible knock-on effect in the real life and that's through abundance that is how I think I met my husband. That is how I've, I have now got a beautiful daughter. That is now I travelled around the world with CBBC. That is how I joined the Met Office. It's just saying, not like I never, I can't, I am to, you know, negative thoughts. It's just that little shift in language has the, and it's the power of the imagination. And that is, and I've, I've read all this through a, a man who died many, many years ago in, his, in the 70s. He was quite big in America in the 40s and 50s and did lots of lectures. His name's Neville Goddard. And you will see his books referenced in free thinkers of the day now, current free thinkers like, say, Dr. Wayne Dyer and Eckhart Tolle. Yeah. And his work, and I've read probably eight or nine of his books now, and a lot of them are just transcribed lectures. His stuff is so simple. And he doesn't use he doesn't use all this airy fairy sort of NLP language. It's not about that at all. It's basically you are who you want to be. Take responsibility for your life, because everything that happens to you happens to you because of you. Yeah. Do not lay the blame anywhere else. Change your thoughts, change your life. Mm, I love that that accountability. That you know that sense of oh life is hard. Well, if you look at life as if it's hard, it will be hard for you. And how, how do you apply that into your life? Well, there's how do you make those changes? Because yeah, well, obviously you're, you're not positive all the time. No one can be. You must yeah. be aware that, okay, I'm thinking negatively. I need to change that. What do you do? How do well, you Well, there's it? a technique which um, I can tell you in two minutes, which is less than that. It's an incredibly powerful technique. And it's something I've just been saying about that I apply to my daughter when she yeah. goes to sleep. So I think the way I do it every night before I go to sleep, um, as I settle down, I'm in that state of slumber where your body feels a little bit heavy. Um, I imagine something that I really need in my life or want in my life or desire um, in my life. So say, I'll give you an example, maybe, and this is a really trivial example, say I would love to be swimming in a Caribbean sea. Okay, in the Caribbean. You know, that's what I mean. Everybody wants to swim in warm water, don't they? And just, you know, fill the soft sand and the warm sun. And then you just, so you imagine, so you, as I'm going to sleep, I am, as me, walking along that beach, feeling the sand, feeling the water, feeling those rays, laughing with my family. I sense that I'm there and I'm almost, I am there. And I then, I am, I am in the present, at that moment, in the now, in the Caribbean. Mm. So that's a very, very simple example. Obviously you can apply it to anything. anything. Yeah. And I think that is the, f and if you go to sleep with those thoughts, those thoughts transcend your dream life. And then in the morning you wake up with a real sense of, oh, you know, it's a really good platform to start every day. I do it in the morning as well when I'm waking up. Well, I, and I don't know if you knew this, but it, intuitively you, you've hit on it, but at, at, just as you're falling asleep and just as you wake up is when you're actually the best able to communicate with your subconscious because your conscious brain is tired, so it kind of puts its barriers down. So you are communicating directly through pictures, which is the way that the subconscious understands things. You're doing that every morning and every night, and that's incredibly powerful. And if you read you know, autobiographies of sportsmen and incredibly successful people, they all do that. Yes, they do. And in fact, if you, Muhammad Ali would yes. go through every move of a fight in his mind a hundred times and that's why he was world champion yeah. 
and it's part of what sports science is about now. It's Absolutely. all about what happens in here. And I've, really. I've read that even you can even do, which is which is great for me because I hate I don't really like weight training very much, but it's, I know it's good for you. But you can lie in bed and imagine yourself weight training, and your muscle strength will go up by up to 30 percent i mean that is just it's magic and but i want that magic in my life every day absolutely and but it's hard that it's hard to do it's it's, mental discipline it's really and i i find it very very difficult i get you know i i find it meditation very difficult both of these things are things which i know i need to be doing more of in my life and i want to be doing more of them in my life but it is that discipline that focus and in our waking lives, we are multitasking, we're juggling 150 things at the same time. So suddenly, to put ourselves in the position where we're focusing on one thing and trying to you know, um, pinpoint our imagination and direct it in, in one area is actually really difficult. And have you found it getting easier the more and more you do yeah. it? I, th- I have, and I found that the... I recognise now when my thoughts are going AWOL and I don't need them in my life. I don't want them. Mm. And that's a really important thing. And we'll talk about that yeah, later with the exercise yes, we're exactly. going to set. Yeah. Fantastic. But I think that the more I do it, the more I just feel a little bit calmer about life as well because it's sort of you go, right, this is what I want. And it, you, it, it takes the pressure of your everyday living because you almost set it in stone already there. You're not overanalyzing. I want no. it, oh, but do I want yeah. it? Because that will mean this, and oh, I'm not sure Well, that's sure the other thing that. you've just hit upon, is it's working out what you really want. I think, and when you're applying this technique, it's really, I mean, as you know, it's, it's, I've just tried to work out what example will I use? Because most of, have, most of, us, of us have so much stuff in our lives. It's like, what do you really want out of life? Okay, okay, you want a brilliant job. What? What job? What do you want to do? Do you want which, what, what type of people? And also keeping it simple, honing it down to its principal parts. Mm. I think that is quite tricky. It is. It's really tricky. And I think a lot of people fall into a job because of opportunity and they just take it. And they've been in it 10 years and maybe they have a family and they have a mortgage. And suddenly these these this confined which they've created in their own minds, but also is there you know, in reality as well because the mortgage does need to be paid, the child does need to be picked up from school, et cetera, et cetera. And suddenly it becomes, I don't know what I want. What am I? You know, they're listening to you and you had this amazing knowledge at such a young age that you, know, you wanted to do something that you were passionate about and you made decisions based on that. I mean, that's a- amazing maturity to have at such a young age. I know I... I don't think I had that kind of clarity. I didn't know what I wanted. I was, you know, the world was exciting and let's just see what happens kind of thing. Um, and I think that a lot of women wake up in their 30s normally and they think, oh gosh, okay, this is where I am. This is my life. It's probably not really what I hoped for in my, you know, when I was sleeping at night when I was a child, but what can I do about it now? And it is, it's difficult. It's working out actually what makes me happy what's right for me not you know for for paying the mortgage not for all the all of the other peripheral things and that's really really tricky yeah it is really tricky it really is especially when you do wake up and I'm sure we've all had those days we've gone oh, I don't want to I don't want to go through this day there's got to be an easier way yes there <laughs> is yeah there's certain days where everything is mundane and it has to be done chores and I'm not, I don't like chores, really. I prefer to be reading a book or going out for a run. Maybe we could reframe it. Chores sounds a bad word. Maybe we can come up with like a more fun word. You have to have a reward at the end of it. Yeah, absolutely. No. <laughs> and I think we might have touched on this, you might have touched on this earlier, but if you were able to go back in time and talk to your younger self, what would you say to her? Well, what we were talking about earlier, Bex, and it's just like, you've got to stop worrying. You've got to stop feeling the fear. And feel it, in, and when I say feel the fear, and I know there was the Erica Young book, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway, and I read that when I was really young. And I was thinking, this will give me some solutions to my fear, because I was scared about everything. I was scared that my parents were going to die. I was scared that we were going to lose the house. I was scared that, you know, nuclear war, you know. And I spent too much energy worrying about things. And I think that worry sort of went, it sort of came into, it went into my 20s as well. Um, and with boyfriends like relationships they were based around the fear of losing the boyfriend or I'm not with the right person 
Um, and there were some times I was quite dark, quite low, and then in my 30s, I got really ill with it. I had um, fibroids with tumours, and I worked it out eventually. It, it was my worry, it was my fear of lying in bed so scared about everything that was going to happen to me. And I wish I could go back to my younger self now through, you know, through the TARDIS and say, Claire, it's okay, it's all right, everything's going to be okay. Because I didn't think it was going to be, and I think that's what drove, I, I, that's why I was so driven. I was going to say, it's, it's interesting, whenever I ask women that question, which I, I love, it's would you be who you are now mm, if exactly. you had that knowledge? Yeah, and I don't know, I really don't. I, maybe I would have come to the same point through a different path. Um, but my, I've always had a, a real inner determination to work out what the meaning of life is. And that sounds like a, quite a cliche uh, phrase, but it's really, why? Why am I here? And how, how am I going to feel happy every day? And I think I've worked it out in my own small way and something which I'm happy with. And I'm still learning and I'm still going to be the pupil f about life for, forevermore. But I think I, I don't think, I think I'm happier now than I've ever been, more content than I've ever been, and live every day more than I've ever been. I used to just live in the future. And what an amazing thing to be able to say. At this stage in your life, you're able to say those things, which I assume, you know, people in their 90s have maybe never been able to say, mm. that you've already reached that at, at a young age. That's amazing. Well, thank you for calling me young. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think it's because I spent all my childhood living in, my, in the future. Um, and even in my 20s, it's like, what's next? What's next? And I think that's when you're on the career path, that's what you do. I want to be here. I want to be here. I want to be here. Even though I love what I do, I want more, you know. And then when, you, when it's taken away from you, and, you know, for many people, I know it has been at some point, you reach almost a peak in your earning and your status. Some people keep going up. Many people plateau. Some people go down. You just have to then take a step back and go, hang on a minute, you know. And I, and I say to my friends, I don't think I've ever been happier. And my contracts now with work in the TV industry are never more than six months. You know, whereas I was a staff member for eight, nine years with the Met Office, 11 years with GMTV. You know, it was a really long period of my time. It was almost like a third of my life, half my life. I've been in, in a, as a staff member with a pension and all those things. And now it's like, wait, oh God, I've got a contract and that's a month long. Well you know, bring it on, basically. I was going to say, yeah. maybe, you know, that, that's actually exciting because you think, okay, I know what I'm doing. Yes, I know what I'm doing for six months and that's brilliant. I'm going to give it my all. And then who knows what's around the corner for the six months after that? As long as you can pay your mortgage. Absolutely. But again, <laughs> that's all up here first. Imagine the money, yeah. paying your mortgage and, you know, spending... Living with abundance. Living with abundance. Yeah, I love that nice. phrase. Well, you are so inspiring, I have to say. <laughs> it's just amazing the way that you... You've clarified who you are and what you want for your own life, and then you've systematically gone about making that happen. I think that's absolutely amazing. Well, thank you, Bex. I think you bring out the best in people, though, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing all of this with me. And I would love now for us to set an exercise for um, the viewers at home based on something that maybe you do in your life or you've done before in your life that you've found particularly helpful and useful. Well, there's one thing which I was talking about earlier, which you can apply when you're lying down in bed before you go to sleep, which is the most beautiful technique. It only takes five minutes. And it's something that many people who learn to meditate try and reach, and some do. They call it cosmic consciousness. And it's something which I've sort of tried to fast track by reading various books. And this technique is all about clearing your mind. So you're lying down on your bed, or just on a, on a surface, maybe you're on the floor, you're just about to maybe turn on the TV for the evening watch or something, and you're closing your eyes and you observe your thoughts. So thoughts will always come up. It's very hard to stop your thoughts completely. So you start observing your thoughts and they're coming and going and coming and going. It's like, oh, I've got to put dinner on. Oh, tomorrow I've got to, you know. And rather than getting involved in each thought, you just let it go. You let it drift off into the ether. And what you find slowly after about 30 seconds or so, those thoughts become less frequent. And that's what I'm looking for here. This is the technique about clearing your mind. Become so less frequent that there are moments where, oh, I just didn't think anything, but then you think, oh, that's I've just thought that, <laughs> yes. And 
this technique, which I try and do most evenings, eventually you get to a point where you do have that moment of, I call it ultimate bliss. And it's a moment of the, the purest calmness where there is no clutter going on in your mind. And then this thought pops back like a bubble, say, and then you think, ah, oh, there's another one, let it go. And then you might even have a millisecond more of that. And those, that, those moments where there are no thoughts or very, very few have a real knock-on effect and it sort of sinks down into your heart, into your body, into your, into your spirit. And if you do that for five minutes a day, the effect on your life is fundamental and it spreads out into every part, your relationship with other people, the way you um, face your problems, face issues which we all have. And for me, it's something which everybody should be doing. It's something I swear by. That sounds beautiful. And, and it, it sounds tricky. It's, it's the most simplest thing to do. Um, but to get those times where you have more, less thought and more sort of quietness, it's just, it's, and also don't put any pressure on yourself. This is it what I was going to say. Don't yeah. feel bad about yourself if you find it hard and you m don't manage any, you know, time of ultimate bliss. Yeah. Next time, try it again and try it again and try it again and slowly, 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 you'll build up and build up. And how long would you say that you can go now without having Oh, no, any it's thoughts? split second still. Split second. But the split second is almost like um, a drop of liquid gold going into yourself. It's just beautiful. And the, the sense of calmness and peace that you get with that, it's what I would say, it's the purest thought, purest feeling. Mm. Um, and it just, it's almost like, you know, something just slowly flowing through your body, which is there forever then, and just keep topping it up. Nice. So it's good. It's a, a form of meditation. Yeah. A form of meditation that takes five minutes, do it for 10 minutes, say, you can do it for longer if you want to. And it will have a knock-on effect on your daily routine for days and days and days. Well, that sounds amazing. I'm going to be trying that tonight for sure. <laughs> well, Claire, thank you so much. Thank I've you, I've loved our chat today and I've learned so much and I really, really enjoyed it. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure.